All right, guys, I'm going to do a little video here, and uh, they're, they're the reason uh, for the video is I've had, I cannot tell you, in the past two weeks probably, I have got probably in the neighborhood of about 20 to 25 emails uh, from guys. Um, you know, they're, they're wanting advice or tips and tricks on uh, restoring their first Tri-5 project. So I what I thought I would do is just do a... Uh, advice style video uh, for the novice or amateur guy that has never restored a car before but is wanting to do it. Uh, I'm all for that. I think all these cars need to be saved before they're gone forever. So uh, there is no better feeling that you will get than taking an old pile of garbage out of a field that everybody has turned down and bringing it back to life and getting it back on the road. Uh, it is an awesome feeling, especially when you go to the gas station to put gas in your car and you get surrounded by other people to check out your car. That is, a, it's a great feeling, especially when you've done it all yourself with your own two hands. There's, I mean, it's just a feeling that you'll have a smile on your face, people giving you thumbs up when you're driving down the road. and It's just an awesome feeling to have an old car and some of you guys that have cars know this. Now, this video is for the amateur novice guy that has never messed with one of these cars before. This is not for you professionals that have a shop or you know you build cars for people or you've built you know 10, 15, 20 cars, whatever. You guys are professionals, you already know this stuff. Now, I do not consider myself a professional. I don't care if I've done 100 cars, I still wouldn't consider myself a professional. Fortunately, when I was uh, old enough, when I got my driver's license in our town that we lived in and all the surrounding towns around us, I knew all of the old guys that built cars and uh, you know, done stuff to cars, old cars. So my thing was to go to their places and I'd hang out there all day. I was like a leech to these guys, man. And uh, I didn't really realize it at the time. I just, I wanted to be around old cars because I loved old cars. Of course, at 16 years old, you know, I didn't have the money to build an old car, but I just loved being around them. And what it ended up being was, you know, I'd go to each place at different times and be there all day and I'd end up helping because they figured out that uh, you know they were getting free labor out of me but what I didn't realize and what they didn't realize is I was getting an education there was nothing better than hands-on education and I cannot tell you how many times I swept these guys floors uh, I learned quite a bit and, and I can tell you right now and especially some guys watching this video what I tell you they were gonna some people will probably disagree because Every one of those guys did things differently. The materials they used, the stuff they did, everybody's different on building a car. There is no two guys the same. So even the stuff I learned, I put my own spin on it. So anyway, it's the same for everything. Building an engine, there, nobody's gonna agree on stuff. You know, doing body work, nobody's gonna agree. Metal work, nobody's gonna agree. Everybody uses their own way. So I have been asked by people for advice and tips so I am going to give them advice and tips. They're not asking you, they're asking me. So anyway, here we go. Now I'm going to give you some good little tips of advice here for your first time, never built a car before, dragging one into your house and working on it. So <clears throat> anyway, so if you drag an old car in, you know, you have these dreams of this shiny paint car, radio blaring down the highway, ready to go to a cruise in or a you know, a show or something. Be prepared to spend thousands of dollars to get to that point. Uh, I have always done just about everything myself. Uh, you have to learn somewhere. And I've always had that look on it as if one guy did something, I can do it too. So do not be afraid to jump in feet first and get dirty because you can do this stuff yourself. And I mean everything. Um, the only thing that I have never done is actually stitch upholstery. <laughs> That's the only thing I have never learned. <clears throat> It'd be something I'd kind of be interested in, but I doubt I ever do it. You know, I'm pretty much, I I'm right at 50 years old now. So, you know, <laughs> it's a little late in the game for me, I think. I mean, not really, but, you know, I don't want to mess with uh, trying to find an upholstery machine and all that. I really don't have the room to do it anyway. But uh, anyway, so... The very first thing you need to do is figure out the direction you're going with your build. 
Are you building just a mostly stock looking car that's you, you just want to drive to the cruise nights and stuff? Or are you going to build a lowered big wheel, you know, four wheel disc brake, uh, pro touring style car? Are you going to build a gasser? You need to know the direction you're going. So, you know, do research, figure out what parts for whatever build you're doing, what people are using. And I can tell you one of the most important things to do besides YouTube videos, which you're going to see two videos on the same thing, they're both going to be different on what they used or how they did it. You need to join a car forum. Car forums are awesome. Uh, there is a car forum for out there for probably anything car related. Like Tri-5 Chevy specific, there's a bunch of them. And, and I can tell you, I'm a member of one. I've been a member there since the early 2000s. Uh, Tri5.com. When you go there, you know, you don't have to pay anything. You just join, sign up or whatever. It's free. Uh, and you can go in and start posting stuff up. Now, I will tell you, for a first-time guy going to a car forum, no matter whether it's Tri5 or not, don't go in there and start asking questions. Chances are that question's been asked 5,000 times in a month. So go to the search box and type in exactly what you're wanting to ask, and it will come up, and there will be a bunch of them you can read. What sucks is, is that, you know, if you're in a hurry, <laughs> you're going to be there a while reading. But uh, anyway, at this specific forum, everything is itemized in there. Electrical, you know, chassis, uh, high performance, you know, everything is itemized in there. So no matter what you're messing with, you can go to that section. So it is a great thing. Now, it is also a good idea if you join a for car forum and you've never posted before, go to the welcome section first and introduce yourself and tell about what car you're working on. That way, some of the guys on there will see it and they will know what kind of car you're working on. And then when you ask a question, they'll have a little bit of an idea what you're working on and what you need. So the other thing about car forums that you may not realize, this is probably the most important, not only do they have a classified section for parts and cars or a wanting to buy section, you can go in there and say, hey, I've got this car, I need this part. Not only do you get that, but if you're not doing your upholstery work or your glass installation or your engine build or your paint and body work or your rust repair, you can go in there and say, hey, I'm in this city, in this state, does anybody know of a place to have that done at? And chances are there will be a guy or two or three that knows a shop in your area that they recommend. So car forums are invaluable. It is a very important part of building your first car. Um, now back when I started, I didn't have internet. This type of stuff was my internet. I had stacks. I actually just threw them all away because I got tired of it. I had stacks of Super Chevy, All Chevy, Street Rotter from like 1990 all the way up until just a few years ago. Uh, I just threw them all away. Some of them I give away, but there was just stacks and stacks and stacks of magazines. That was how I learned to do quite a bit of stuff. So this is not a drop in the bucket of the books I have in my house. Uh, I have a closet in a spare bedroom that is probably a two foot tall stack of how-to book stuff like this. But anyway, very, very invaluable. Now, some of these I bought, you know, back in the early 2000s and 90s or, you know, later 2000s. It's, uh, I've always liked reading and, you know, seeing the pictures and stuff. Uh, some of them I've got from people, but anyway, if you're going to build a mostly stock tri by Chevy, the most important book that you need to buy right off the bat is the assembly manual. Now, you can find these on eBay from prices mild to wild, but this is the most important. This has tells you how to keep your car on the road and re, pretty much rebuild anything you need to rebuild. Invaluable information in there on every single thing. So uh, get an assembly manual. Uh, I, you know, if you're going to do some wiring work on the car, I would buy a wiring diagram for the car, which they are in the shop manual, but you can get a diagram like this from any of the Tri-5 suppliers, and it kind of, it's a little bit easier to look at than it is in the shop manual for me, but anyway, I, I do have to say this is a pretty decent little book as well. Uh, my dad gave me this one, pretty thick book. Uh, it has a lot of the shop manual stuff in it, but anyway, good stuff. 
The other thing you're going to need is uh, Tri-5 restoration catalogs like uh, from H&H, &H, not a sponsor, and like from Dan Chuck, not a sponsor. That is the only two companies that I really kind of like to mess with, uh, especially H&H. &H. And the reason is, I used to live in the upper northeast part of Oklahoma, um, and I could drive to their place in like, I don't know, like an hour and a half or something drive. It wasn't that far to drive to their place. So I got on a first name basis with these people back in early 90s when I started working on my first 55. Um, anyway, when you go to their website, uh, if it says on there, uh, it usually tells you when you pull a part up, it'll tell you how many is in stock or it will say out of stock. I have also had them call me after I placed an order and say, hey, the computer wasn't right. Uh, we don't have this part. So what do you want to do? Because at that point, it's on back order. And truth is, you never know when something's going to come in. They just give you an estimated date. But I have ordered parts from another Tri-5 supplier that I don't want to start, you know, say their name. It may start with an E, but I have ordered parts from them. And I'll ask is it in stock? Oh yeah, yeah, it's in stock. And then you wait and you wait and you wait. And then I call back. Well, that's on back order. They didn't tell you that. No, they didn't tell me that. So anyway, these are the two main ones that I like. So anyway, get you a couple of catalogs. And the reason I say that is you can go through a picture catalog. You can go online and you can spend two hours or three hours on the internet on their website looking at parts, but you got to know what you're looking for. You go through this catalog, you're going to see something that's like, hey, I need that. So you need a catalog. Now, this video is getting long, so I'm going to try to uh, get to it here. Now I'm going to make another video, and I'm going to talk about like rust repair stuff. Uh, pretty basic stuff, just the fundamental type stuff. Uh, but the other thing I want to talk about right now is when you drag your car home, it, you need to look at the shape that car is in. If this is your first car, uh, you drag it in and it's all together, like the you know the motors in it and all this stuff. If it's all together and you're wanting to restore that car shiny and brand new looking, and you're on a shoestring budget, that is what I'm mainly gearing this video for is the the amateur, not so rich guys. <clears throat> if the car is mostly together, my advice is to. Just do mechanical side of the car, get it up, running, and driving. That way you can start using the car. That way you can figure out what you don't like about the car or do like, and then you'll know what parts to get. Like some guys cannot stand the ratio on the steering box of these cars because you have to, you go to turn into a parking lot and you got to turn the steering wheel like three times to get it to, to pull in there. I personally don't mind. It's part of the old car experience, so I never have done a power steering conversion on these cars. It's just, for me, I don't need it. Um, but you can if you want. Anyway, the reason I say that, you can basically, if you're on a shoestring budget, you get a little bit of money, you know, like you get your paycheck, and you can spend, say, 50 bucks or 100 bucks out of the paycheck. You can buy one part. Uh, like, have your list. Buy a part. Rat hole it. You know, put it away. And then get another check and then buy another part and put it away. So over the course of a year or two, you can buy everything brand new for that car. Your glass, your weather stripping, you know, interior kit, everything you need for that car. Get your primers, your body stuff, your paint, all that. Buy every single thing for that car. Even if it takes a couple of years, you can take the car out and drive it and enjoy it in the patina that it's in. Patina is kind of popular right now for people. Some guys like that stuff. Um, but anyway... That it would be the direction I would push you toward. Because uh, then you can start enjoying the car and you don't have a stripped apart gutted shell in your barn, driveway, or under your shade tree or whatever for a couple of years. So anyway, once you have everything bought, then tear that car apart and do your restoration work on it. And that way it'll go a little bit more smooth and uh, you, know, you can mock up some of the new parts and make sure they fit and that type of stuff. Now. On the disassembly side of your car, this is the biggest mistake I have seen people make. I have seen this a thousand times and I'm guilty of it myself when I first started. This is something you need to invest in. These little craft bags right here. You'll get these at say Walmart in the craft department. These are called craft bags and all they are is pretty much miniature Ziplocs. Always have three different sizes. 
I have the sandwich style baggies. I usually have quarts, but I'm out, and then a gallon thing of them. Um, anyway, you'll need a Sharpie, and anytime you take something apart, tag it and bag it. Write on there what it goes to and put them in a bag. You know, some of the stuff is larger, so you're going to need larger bags, obviously. Now, in the event that you get up here and take your, I'm just going to say the wing window assembly, for instance, you know, the mechanical part of it and, and all the stuff. There's quite a bit of different length hardware and, and regular bolts and stuff in here for just one thing. So if you threw all that in a bag, you may not remember in a couple of years down the road how that goes back together. So what you do is you get a notebook. That's another thing you need to buy is a notebook. And you can make notes, write down what parts you need. And it basically what that does is it saves you if you skip a few months or a year before you go back out there and work on the car again, you're gonna forget some stuff. So you can get that notebook out and you can catch up on reading your notes and it'll put you right back where you were if you make a lot of notes in it. But you can take a piece of that notebook paper and you can draw out that wing window assembly and then write arrows to you know the screw hole locations or whatever and you can write on there what screws went where what bolts went where because some of them are going to be different length so measure if they're different length hardware measure them write that on that notebook paper and then fold it up into little squares and put it inside that bag with the hardware then a couple years down the road when you go in there to work on that door you've got a treasure map to read to know where that stuff goes now i'm going to give you a tip in case some of your bolts break off and you know or some bolts are missing and you need to go down to your local hardware store and buy a bolt some guys may not know this when like you're looking at the bolt bins and they say it's three quarters of an inch long bolt you know like a 5 16 by 18 by three quarter they are not measuring from the end of the head to the end of the bolt it is always under head length so it's under head length is what you're measuring so if you wanted a, a one and a quarter long bolt, it would actually be one and a half long if you're measuring off the top of the head. So always remember that's under head length. Now, here is the best reason for tagging and bagging every single thing on that car. This is gonna be a nice little eye-opening experience for you right here. I have just four pieces of hardware laying here out of a Tri-5 Chevy. They are different, and there are lots of others that are oddball and unique to these cars. This is one of them right here. If you pulled this out of a box or a tote and you just threw all your stuff in there, would you know what that went to a couple years down the road? There will be four of those in your box. These are your trunk hinge bolts. Pretty unique little cupped in washer there. Then you got these guys right here. Now these are unique. So this is a 5 16 by 24 fine thread bolt. When you have a 5 16 bolt, whether it's coarse thread or fine thread, it usually takes a half inch wrench. This takes a 9 16 wrench or socket, so that is a pretty specific bolt. It has a star washer pressed on it. These, if you've been following the build on this car so far, this is for the door hinges to the doors right here. You'll have six per door of your front doors. So anyway, that, that is what that bolt's for. And uh, what I'm trying to get a, my point across is if you throw all this crap in a box and you dig this stuff out, you're not going to know where it goes. This little guy right here. This is a 5 16 by 24 fine thread bolt, and it does take a half inch or, you know, socket or wrench, but has a star washer pressed on it. These are for your front seat, your brackets here at the front, and then there will be two holes in the floor back here to bolt the brackets down to the floor. And then there will be a bunch of these little guys in there. And this you might remember because there were so many of them you had to take out. And in many cases on these cars, if a car has never been messed with, there's going to be a goopy mess over the top of each screw hole. It's butyl is what it is, but it'll still be kind of gummy. You'll have to peel it off to get access to that screw. But there will be a bunch of these in every door. They hold the regulators in, uh, the window tracks, your window handle. You know, So there's going to be a bunch of those. They're going to be in your rear door of your four doors. They're going to be in the rear back here on a two door. So anyway, it's basically just an example of what you get into. <clears throat> now, if you drag in a car and you've never done this before and you're thinking on a shoestring budget, you're going to get that car up and running, driving down the road for no money or a little bit of money. That's where you're going to be wrong. Now, no doubt you can drag cars in. There's lots of guys on YouTube that are dragging stuff in that's been sitting for decades and they'll get it up and run and drive and take off down the road. 
It's probably not going to be reliable and it's really not that safe. So I like to change all that stuff out so I don't have to pay a $200 tow bill to a tow company over a $20 part messing up on me. So it, to give you an idea of what it's going to cost to fix up a car, I'm going to give you an example here and this might kind of help you figure out that, hey, that's going to cost a lot of money to fix that car. And again, I'm not trying to deter you from restoring an old car. There's a bunch of them out there that need your help. So if you got the time and the money to do it, I am definitely all for it. It doesn't have to be a tri five shift. It can be anything. I, I hate seeing stuff get crushed or just rotted away in a field. So look at a car as systems. Cars have many systems. You have an electrical system. You have a cooling system. You have brake system. You have a fuel system. I mean, there's systems all over the car. Now, when you think about it, like you drag a car in that's been sitting since 1975, it's going to need all that brake stuff replaced, every bit of it. The master cylinder is going to be corroded and rusty. Uh, your wheel cylinders at all four corners are going to be rusted. Your rubber brake hoses are going to be dried out and cracked. So you're going to have to replace a lot of stuff. The brake shoes, that's another thing. The brake shoes on these cars, the old stuff... Uh, I'm not sure what material they made them old brake shoes out of. I don't know if it was asbestos or what it was. That stuff over decades turns to a hard plastic. So it ain't going to stop a car. So anyway, by the time you buy a new master cylinder, all four wheel cylinders, new brake shoes, new rubber hoses, there's two in the front and one in the rear, you're going to have a lot of money in that car. A lot of money just in the brake system. Hundreds of dollars in the brake system. Now I will tell you, if you're going to do, and that's the way it is on when you're building a car, uh, for a stock replacement part, compare that price to what it would cost to upgrade. And the meaning is, like from a single reservoir master cylinder to a dual, not only do you have to replace that master cylinder, which you don't have to have power, you can, have, you can leave it manual with disc brakes if you wanted to, but you also have to add in a proportioning valve and brake lines, which is more of a cost. Single reservoir master cylinders are pretty dangerous, meaning one reservoir in that master cylinder supplies brake fluid to all four corners of the wheels. So in the event that one of your wheel cylinders blows out or starts leaking, you're, you're not going to have any brakes. So if you're going to run a single master cylinder, make sure your emergency brake cable is properly adjusted and working good because you may have to hit it. So anyway, if you rebuilt all of the brakes on the front of your car, your 55, 6, or 7 in the drums. These cars had ball bearings. Almost every one of them I drug in when I first started, I didn't have the money to do disc brake conversion. And anyway, I would get them cars up and running and driving, and those old ball bearings would roar and howl, so I'd always have to replace those bearings. And ball bearings replacements are expensive. Now, they do have a tapered roller bearing hub conversion in some of the catalogs for Tri-5 parts. That's an expensive change to still keep your drums. By the time you add in a good quality metallic line brake shoe, have your drums surface properly, do new wheel cylinders, a new hardware kit, all that type of stuff, for just a little bit more, you can have a disc brake conversion. The one I like, I have used a bunch of, is the Speedway disc brake kit. They offer one for a G-Body, they offer one for a Chevelle. Uh, it's around 250 bucks, and it's a no-brainer. It's a complete kit, and it comes with tapered roller bearings instead of the old ball bearings. So it, it is very, very good kit. I've had good luck with all of them. So that, is, that would be my recommendation, recommendation for the budget guy. Now, if you're going to do a big pro touring car and you've got to have them $1,500, 13-inch brakes in the front, that ain't the kit for you. I'm, as I stated, this, this is for the guys like me on a shoestring budget. You don't have to have high-end parts on a car. Uh, the, the original stuff will get you by just fine. So anyway, so I'm just trying to get you through. When you break it down into systems, it's going to be expensive. Now, more than likely, your old gas tank's going to be junk in the car. It's going to be crusted and rusty. Sometimes I've drug them in and the bottoms are gone out of them. In the event that your gas tank might look okay, but the inside is all nasty, you can put some muriatic acid in that gas tank and let it set for a little bit and then flush it out. You can get a gallon of muriatic acid at a hardware store or a box, you know, home repair store. 
excuse me, for about, you know, around 10 bucks. And anyway, you can put it in there and then flip it over and do all that kind of stuff. And it'll clean that metal to bare metal and make it work good. So I will tell you what I just recently found, which was kind of a surprise to me because I usually replace the gas tanks with brand new and the sending unit. So I don't mess with any of that stuff. Just replace it. Especially if it's going to be something you're going to drive. You don't want that crud coming loose, clogging up your filters or clogging up your line, and then you're stalled on the side of the road and have to pay a tow truck to come and get you. So I just recently found at Rock Auto, they have gas tanks for these cars for under $100. So it's kind of a no-brainer. So anyway, just to give you an idea on systems, be prepared. You're going to spend a lot of money. So, But don't let it deter you because, you know, as I've always said in a lot of my videos, I got more time than I got money. So I don't mind putting in the work and stretching something out. So anyway, guys, I'm going to go ahead and cut this video off. I just tried to give a little bit of basic info for the first time guy working on a car. And it don't have to be a tri -fi. I just, you know, try to give you some, some ideas there. But uh, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and do another video uh, right now. And I will link it uh, at the end of this one or vice versa. Uh, and I'm going to talk about rust repair and that type of stuff uh, because I see a lot of mistakes like that being made. So anyway, thanks for watching. All right, I'm going to add this into the video because I, I missed this part of it. So I showed this and I said this is what you needed and I said assembly manual. This is a shop manual. This is the one you need that has every bit of information you need. There is an assembly manual here. Uh, but this is the one you need. So shop manual, not assembly. Now, the most important thing that I forgot to put in that video, and it should have been the very first thing out of my mouth uh, for the guys wanting to brat, you know, drag in on these cars and they've never worked on one before, do not settle on the car. And I mean, if you're wanting a 55 Chevy, don't settle on a 57 just because it's $1,000 cheaper and it's three houses down from your house. Get the car you want. The reason being, if you want a 55 and you got a 57, you're not going to be in love with it. It's not the car you wanted. So you will find yourself not motivated enough to go out there and work on the car. So I should have said that the very first thing. That is probably the most important. Now, on settling, I should probably speak about that a little bit more. Now, no doubt, most people want two doors. No doubt. Um... The fact is, the price of two doors is is pretty big increase over a four door. Now you got to keep in mind, some guys that don't have a lot of money, they're going to have to have a four door. And I'll tell you, there's nothing wrong with that, especially in today's world. Things have changed from the way they used to be. Uh, lots of guys will, you know, consider four doors parts cars, and you know, two doors are cooler and all that. Well, no doubt. I mean, I, I love two doors too, but I like four doors as well. Now, four doors are more practical, especially if you have kids. Uh, case in point, uh, about 20 years ago, uh, uh, our friends came over, another married couple. We decided to go to dinner downtown. So they come over and I, I had a two door 55. I had to fold the seat for, for them to climb in the back of. Now adults climbing in the back of a little bitty spot of the back to get in the back seat of a two door, it's a little, you know, awkward. If, they, if it had been a four door, they could have opened their door and got right in and out with no problem. So, you know, keep that in mind. Now again, four doors are a little bit more socially acceptable nowadays than what they used to be, whether you realize it or not, because there are lots of new cars nowadays that will bust your two doors butt at a stoplight race and it has four doors. So uh, like a Hellcat Dodge Charger, 10.9 second quarter mile. So you can spend all the money and everything you want on your two door Tri-5 Chevy or whatever, no matter what it is, and be at a stoplight and get busted by a brand new car with two more doors. So, you know, even import cars, some of them's four doors and some of them's pretty awesome. So they are a bit more socially acceptable. Uh, they are cheaper and they are more practical. I can tell you that. So. Anyway, guys, thought I would throw that clip in. And again, thanks for watching.